stickers. I'm kind of excited. Um, one of the reasons why I think maybe I'm a little bit nervous is I know that we have um, international viewers today. Um, a good friend of mine uh, from Denmark, his name's Christian, and he is at home watching with his three children. And oh, I told them, I'm gonna totally butcher how to pronounce your name. Um, but Sophia and Mingus and Celia are watching from Denmark. So hello from America. And uh, so this should be fun. Um, I'm going to introduce you today to our line of Fistler pressure cookers. How many of you already own a pressure cooker? Oh, good. How many of you own more than one pressure cooker? <laughs> um, how many own three pressure cookers? How many own four pressure cookers? See, I kind of cheat because I get to use whatever I want from the kitchen. So, but I do actually own four different size pressure cookers and I use them all the time. My kids, um, I'm sure you've heard me talk about them. They are 10, seven, and six now. And we are a very, very busy family. I work full time, my husband is a fireman, we homeschool our kids, we do baseball, we do all that stuff. And I had a lady ask me last baseball season, she said, how, how do you eat? Because she saw that we were not buying food at the ballpark every game. And she said, how do you, you know, how do y'all eat dinner? And I said, my pressure cooker, I couldn't live without my pressure cooker. So um, how many of you have been to the pressure cooking class that my mom, Sue Becker, teaches? Okay, we're gonna do a couple of the same recipes just because they're our family favorites and I knew we would have some new viewers and new people in the class. So we'll do a couple of new ones um, and then a couple of the same ones that Sue does in her class just because they're too good not to, not to serve you guys again. Um, the great thing about pressure cooking Number one, they're not your mom's pressure cooker, or they're not your grandma's pressure cooker, they're not your great grandma's pressure cooker. You're not going to end up like Lucy and Ethel with a chicken on your ceiling, okay? You're not going to explode these pressure cookers. These are very, very safe. They are constructed of an 1810 gauge stainless steel. They have a nice thick bottom of the, on them. They also have this cook star um, on the bottom and that allows even cooking. So you're not gonna get hot spots and burns in some places and things like that. It's also not going to warp um, or you know bubble up or anything like that, um, which makes it very, very nice. It also has um, a thick um, aluminum core, which makes it very energy efficient here on the bottom. Um, there are lines on the inside so that when you're doing things, like in these tall pots, these are considered stock pots for doing soups and stocks and things like that. There's lines here on the inside that give you a max fill line for liquids so that it doesn't, um, you don't get liquids up into the, the valve here, the pressure valve here. I've put at the front of your handout more information on the pressure cookers and what makes them so nice. They have a limited, or they have a lifetime warranty on, on the pots themselves. Um, I would not put the gasket in your dishwasher. I mean, it's too easy to just take it out, clean it real quick, but the pot itself is completely dishwasher safe, so you can do that. Um, you do wanna be careful that you don't get any cuts or nicks um, in your gasket, because if you, if you get a cut or a nick in it, then it's not gonna build pressure the next time you go to cook something. So you just wanna be sure to keep that nice and, and safe inside the lid there. Um, the nice thing about this particular line of Fistler pressure cookers, we used to carry the Blue Point pressure cookers and that's what we carried for years from Fistler. And they modified a few things, made them better. They kind of streamlined the shape so that even if you end up with two of the same size, they will nest inside of each other because of the narrower bottom here and the, top, and the wider top. The other nice thing that they did on the lids, the old blue point pressure cookers, um, the lids, you would close it and it had a button here. And you had to make sure that you remembered to slide that button into the lock position so that it would start building pressure and then cooking. Well, a lot of people, us included, especially in a cooking class, we would forget to lock the lid in place. And so with it unlocked, it's just a regular pot and it's 
you know, you've got it on high heat, it's, the liquids are in there are boiling away, it was very easy to accidentally burn your food. Um, and it wouldn't be building pressure and you'd be like, what is wrong with my pressure cooker? And then you realized, oh, I forgot to lock the lid in place. So one of the new features on the Fistler is this automatic locking mechanism. As soon as you close the lid, it locks in place, okay? And you can see there's a little green saying that it is locked. And as it starts building pressure, the way that you release the pressure is by pushing on this button and it will not unlock until all of the pressure has been relieved from the pot, okay? I'm gonna talk a little bit about, this is the pressure valve here. So as it starts building pressure, this little indicator pops up. There's the first ring and there's the second ring, okay? Um, I don't know if I have it written down. I believe that the first ring is eight pounds of pressure and the second ring is 12 to 15 pounds of pressure. They've taken these up a lot higher than that and not exploded. It has several safety features, safety release mechanisms. It will start spewing steam here and here and even around the sides if it needs to release any pressure, but it will not explode on you. Um, so a lot of the recipes, it'll tell you, take the pressure up on high heat to the second ring or the first ring. Once it reaches that point, that's when you start your timer for cooking. That's also when you reduce your temperature. So you bring it up to pressure on high heat and then you reduce your heat just to maintain the pressure in the pot. Um, these cooktops here, they go from one to nine, nine being your highest. Most of the time, depending on how much is in the pot, I can reduce it down to a two or a three and it will maintain the pressure. So that's also the nice thing about it, and I love using my pressure cookers in the summertime, is it really doesn't put off that much heat in my kitchen, and it reduces your cooking time so much, it's, it doesn't take very long to cook anything. So um, let's see, what was the other thing that I was gonna tell them about these? Oh, the three different ways of releasing pressure. Because you'll see this in different recipes. There is a natural release, and that just means it's up to pressure, you've cooked it, the timer is up, you set it off the heat and let it naturally come down. That's a natural release method, okay? Then there's a quick release method, and that is, like I said, pushing this button and pushing and pushing and pushing, we'll do it in a little bit, and all the steam starts coming out and the pressure drops, and then it unlocks because all the pressure's gone and you can take it off. That's a quick release. Then the cold water release method is actually you take the pot to your sink, you run cold water over the edge, and it almost immediately comes down. I mean, it's less than a minute, all the pressure comes down. And you can certainly help it along by pushing on the button as well to release the pressure. The time when you would use that, quick, that cold water release method is if you're doing something like green beans or cooking vegetables that cook very quickly and you wanna stop the cooking process. Because as long as there is pressure in the pot, the food is cooking, okay? So let's get started with our first recipe. Go ahead and turn to it in your handout. We are going to do the lentil and sweet potato stew. I'm going to get my hot, my, my pot getting warm here. And we're going to start with a little bit of olive oil and we're going to get our spices going here. This recipe I actually found online. A friend of mine turned me on to this website and it was, um, it's a natural, it's like a detox cleansing website and it's like a three week cleansing plan or something like that. And they have a lot of really, they had a lot of really great recipes on it. In fact, another recipe I'm doing in this class came from that website. I modified it a little bit. Um, I added the chicken and the, I am gonna use vegetable broth here today, but you could certainly leave out the chicken and this would be a completely vegetarian soup and it's really, really good. So we're gonna start with um, over a medium heat, we're gonna let our oil get a little bit warm and then I've got our diced onion and I've got some garlic here, get my garlic press. And then I've got our spices. I actually need my garlic press and I don't know where it is. Will you find it for me? Thanks. We're gonna get our, this is our cumin, our allspice, our curry powder, 
our, and our ground ginger. I've just got it all mixed into one, one bowl because I pre-measured it all. Thank you. That would be my sister Olivia, who's the youngest. Yes, did you clue into that, that she's the youngest? She thinks she's the most special. All babies do. But all of us oldest children know that we are the most special. If your parents had more children, after you being the oldest, they were trying to get perfection again. And like my parents, having nine of us, they finally just gave up and realized they weren't going to ever have another one of me. Or I was the, or I was the test child. That's what, that's what Olivia says. All right, so we've got our spices and our olive oil in there. Now we're just going to dump in our onion. We're just going to let this cook on kind of a medium heat just to soften those up. I'm going to add a little bit of salt here. This has actually become one of my kids' favorite soups. They really like this, which is funny because you wouldn't think that kids would particularly like the cumin and the curry and the ginger and all that, but they really do. All right, I wanna show you a trick to cutting up, can you guys see over there? Cutting up a bell pepper. I actually learned this from Chef Lars. Have any of y'all come to our fresher cooking classes with Lars? from Fissler. He's one of Fissler's celebrity chefs. My dad calls him Dreamy Lars because all of the girls flock to Dreamy Lars because he's from Germany and he's got an accent. All right. Just took the, the middle out. And now you can certainly cut around that stem And you don't have to deal with all of those seeds. And now we're just going to slice this in strips and then I'll dice them. This is also how I do my, when I roast peppers. Did y'all come to the, the fall class and then my soup class and I showed you how to roast your vet own vegetables? And I have started roasting bell peppers. I'll buy the, the three pack, the yellow, the orange, and the red bell peppers. And I will just do the entire package like this in strips. Coat them with olive oil and a good bit of salt. Give this a stir. And, um, and I'll roast them and then I just put them in a plastic container and keep them in my refrigerator and we'll add them to sandwiches. I've started adding them to a, um, I've started doing a kale and roasted pepper frittata for breakfast that's really good. I know that recipe, we'll be doing that in a class hopefully here soon. I've got to come up with some summer recipes and some more classes. All right, so in goes our pepper. And then we'll just chop up this one. You could certainly use um, the lentils called for in this recipe. You could use a red lentil if you wanted to. You could use a French green lentil. I'm just using our regular green lentil today. The French lentils, you could use you could use the French green lentils, but I'm just using a regular a regular lentil today. But it's totally up to you. And we carry French green lentils and we carry just the regular and we carry them both in organic as well. 
is there a difference in the taste? I honestly do not know because I keep just the regular. Is there a little bit of a taste difference? What is the difference between the taste in them? Okay, French green are a little bit more bitter. And then, has anybody had a, a red, a red lentil? You love them? And I've only ever cooked with the green, with just the, the plain lentil, which I'm just gonna go ahead and dump in here. And we're gonna get our lentils and our bell peppers. And then I'm gonna throw in our chicken and our sweet potato and get them all coated and all of these spices. And these are just chicken strips that I went ahead and just cut into chunks. And that way, I mean, you could certainly do a couple of whole chicken breasts if you wanted to. You would just need to fish them out of the soup and chunk them up or shred them or something like that. And I figured, well, why go to that trouble? Why don't I just go ahead and chunk the chicken now? And, uh, and that way too, it'll also cook faster that way. All right. So now let's add our eight cups of broth. Like I said, you could certainly, you could do chicken broth. I'm gonna do vegetable here. And I decided to do vegetable just because I didn't want it tasting like chicken soup. I want you to still taste all of the vegetables and all of the spices and everything. I'm gonna go ahead and turn my heat all the way up to high now because I want that broth to start getting hot. One trick to getting your pressure cooker to come up to pressure quickly is to get your liquids boiling before you put the lid and lock the lid into place. If you put the lid on and your liquids are all still cold, it can take a, a little bit longer for it to come up to pressure. All right, I'm right at the max fill line, but that's all right. My mom calls us Lucy and Ethel anyway, so. This is the six liter stock pot. All right, I'm gonna let that sit here and start getting hot and then we will put the the lid on and lock that in place while I while we do that Karen I am ready for those rolls please ma'am what's that that how many servings oh let's see all of us ate this pot of soup two days ago when I made it and I think there was ten of us here and I'm talking big bowls of it. Um, I think certainly if you had this with salad and with bread, you could easily feed 10 with it. All right, the next recipe in your handout is the quick dinner rolls. If you were at my soup and bread class back in, oh gosh, I don't even remember when it was, January? It was January, wasn't it? It was. Um, I showed you my trick to making and having hot rolls whenever you want. Okay, so I've given you the recipe again in this handout. It was one basic dough recipe from our cookbook. Okay, I took that basic dough recipe and I took our cookie scoop and when the dough was done, I scooped out the dough with our little cookie scoop into my mini muffin pan. I let them rise till they were double in size and then I baked them in the oven and I used that half baked method that I've given you in the handout. So I baked it 400 degrees for eight to nine minutes is all. So you don't want them getting brown. You want them done, but you don't want them browning, okay? And then you're gonna let them completely cool and you're gonna bag them up and you're gonna put them in your freezer. And then when you are ready for rolls and for bread, you're gonna take these straight out of the freezer and you're gonna put them back into your pan. And I've done this, I, I usually do put them back into my mini muffin pan, but you could certainly just throw them back onto a cookie sheet because they've already, they're already in their shape. They're not gonna spread out or anything. So then you're just gonna stick them back down in your muffin pans. 
No, I like because they get it brown on all the sides because the, you've got a pan touching them. Hmm. I don't think these are the ones that I made yesterday. Will you bring me another bag? <clears throat> I think those two are the bags that I made yesterday. But that's all right. That means that these are from January. Which is awesome because the ones that, I, because I do this now, every time I make bread for my family, if I'm making sandwich bread, I will go ahead and make a double batch of dough and I will make my loaves of sandwich bread that we need for that week and then I will scoop out my rolls into the pans so that I have, and I think I have three or four bags in my freezer at home and they can go, they can stay there for several months. And then when you are ready for dinner, you're gonna preheat your oven back to 400 degrees and you're gonna pop them in frozen like this and you're gonna bake them for five to seven minutes. And that's going to brown, thaw, thaw them, warm them, and brown them on top. And then you can go straight to your table. Did you have a question? What type of wheat did I use? This is, well, seeing how I think this dough is from January, um, but it looks like all hard white is what it looks like. But you could do whatever, whatever you want. You can certainly do whatever you want. So I'm gonna pop these into my oven. There we go. You can see that our soup is starting to bubble. It's starting to get really hot. A lot of times it can help to give it a stir, distribute that heat around, and it will come up to pressure a lot faster that way. Okay. We're gonna go ahead and we're gonna lock our lid into place here and we're going to wait for it to come up to pressure. Once it comes up to pressure, like I said, we're going to reduce our heat just to maintain the pressure and then we're going to let this cook for 10 minutes. And then we're going to use a, what did I put? A quick release, which is gonna to be to push the button, quick release method and then it'll be ready to serve. Yes, ma'am. Uh-huh. Right, her question is, does it make a sound when it comes up to pressure? The old fashioned ones, you had the weight on top and they would ch -ch 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 -ch. No, these are completely silent. So you do want to stay close by. Now when it gets over pressure, and we may let this one come over pressure just a little bit, it will start hissing because it will start releasing pressure as a safety feature. Um, and so you'll hear that. So usually if you hear it, that means you better go and reduce your heat. The, the first ring, her question was, what are the pounds of pressure? I believe, if my memory is correct, the first ring that comes up is eight pounds of pressure, and the second ring that comes up is t either 12 or 15. I believe it's 12 pounds of pressure. And that's what you're cooking at. I mean, you're cooking at 12 pounds of pressure. That's, that's, ac that's not that high of a pressure, okay? So that is that recipe. We're gonna let that cook. And we're gonna move on to our, our next recipe. I'm just gonna move this over. I'm gonna need that other burner that you guys have over there set up. And I may let you whisk this pot away. All right, let me move some things out of my way a little bit. The next recipe we're gonna do is another brand new recipe. And it is yummy. And I have made it, oh gosh, several times now for my family and I've done it all different ways. Uh, yeah, that's fine. On high. Thank you. Um, I've done this recipe with the drumettes. I've done the big chicken legs. I've done just regular strips. I'll get to you in just a second. I've done just the strips that were boneless, completely boneless, and my kids absolutely, absolutely love it. What was your question? Her question was, can you use them on a glass top stove? Absolutely you can. Absolutely you can. You might wanna just check your owner's manual and make sure that, you know, like the big ones, you're not overhanging. Um, I know that most glass top stoves don't, they don't recommend you let things hang over the actual burner because they want you to crack the glass or anything like that. Um, so you would just need to check that. But yes, I have, a, I have a glass top stove. So they work on glass top stoves. They obviously, these are induction burners. 
um, because of the stainless steel. They're magnetic, so you can use them on the induction burners. Um, and an induction stove, you can use them on gas, you can use them on electric. Um, I will tell you that gas stoves, I'm gonna go ahead and get this warming. Glass, um, the glass tops and electric like coil burners, they take a little while to adjust. So when you reduce the heat, it, there's a little bit of a reaction time there. So you just wanna make sure you watch that. General rule of thumb actually with glass tops and electric coils are once the pressure comes up to the first ring, go ahead and reduce your heat because it's gonna take a little while for it to react and it's still gonna build pressure and then it'll level out right about the time it gets up to the second ring. So if you have a glass top or an electric coil burner, then you're going to reduce your heat as soon as it gets to that first ring and then it'll continue to climb a little bit and then it should all level out. Then with your gas ovens and with like the induction cooktops, they both react very, very quickly. And so you wait until they come up to the second ring before you adjust them. All right, this pot that I'm using here is probably one of my favorites. This is the four liter. I don't know, do they consider it a skillet in the Quattro set? This is um, the four liter skillet. It has, did you notice the bottom here? Can y'all see that? This is considered a waffled bottom. This actually allows you to braise meats without any oil. And that waffled texture, once the meat browns on that side and starts releasing its own juices, it will completely pull away from the pan and won't stick to it, which is really nice. Um, and so with all of the other pots though, if you get one and it's not the waffle bottom and you want to braise meat, just put a little bit of olive oil in there and you can still braise, braise your meats or your wings or whatever you're going to do. So I'm just going to let this get a little bit warmer here and we're going to braise our chicken wings. Like I said, I've done this, I'm doing the little drumettes today. I've done them with the, we grew up calling them the one bone and the two bone uh, chicken wings. I've done it with that. I've done it with the big legs. And it was funny because when I cooked the legs the other night, I did the, the legs for the first time, and I figured, oh, I'll, I'll have to cook them a little bit longer because it's a bigger piece of meat on a bone. I don't think you're gonna need to cook them longer. I cooked them just two minutes longer and the meat was falling off the bones. And I ended up tearing every bit of meat off and I just chopped it all up and the kids had it with rice. Um, on the side and it was just, and it was really good, but it totally ruined my theory of being able to have nice big chicken wings because it was falling off the bone. There was no eating them that way. All right, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna put our little drumettes here in our pan. You can hear it sizzling. And they will stick right at first. And you'll be like, oh no, what have I done? And that's why you kind of want it on a semi-hot, semi-high. It's like I've got mine on a six right now. There's supposedly a test you can do. But like I said, that waffled bottom, it's they're stuck to it but then as it browns and it kind of gets crispy on that side, it'll start releasing its own juices and it will completely pull away. I've got three more that I'm gonna shove down in here. All right, so we're gonna let those crisp up a little bit on that side. And while we do that, we're gonna get our sauce mixture. I did decide to go ahead and use um, a gluten-free soy sauce here today, just because I didn't know if we had any gluten-free customers. So I'm gonna do, this was about three pounds of chicken drumettes, thereabouts. So I'm doing my half a cup of soy sauce. 
my three tablespoons of rice vinegar. I will tell you this, um, if you do not want to do this whole braising portion, you don't have to. I mean, you can just throw, the, throw them in there, throw the sauce on top of them and go. But I wanted to show you this feature. How, you would still cook them the same amount of time even if you don't braise them. This just gives them that brown side, a little bit of a crispier side to them. I always think it's funny how they make tongs and things like that now that are like silicone so nothing sticks to them. It also makes it very difficult to pick anything up with them. Sometimes I think maybe we've gone a little too far on the non-stick thing. We're just gonna kinda flip all these over, let them get brown a little bit on the other side. And it's okay if little bits are kinda stuck to the, stuck to the pan because we're gonna deglaze it here in a minute and the sauce is gonna pick all that up. And it's actually just going to add to the to the flavor of the dish. All right, so we've got our soy sauce and we've got our rice vinegar. Now we're going to do our honey. And I'm so totally not going to measure this because you know how I feel about measuring things. We're going to do three tablespoons. That's like one. That's two, that's three, a little more just because I like it, it's a little sweeter. This is our two teaspoons of ground ginger, and then two tablespoons of chili paste. It is Sambel Olique is the brand that I got, and I just picked this up. I think I got this one at Kroger. You can find chili paste on the international aisle um, at Kroger or Publix. A lot of times it'll say chili and garlic paste is what it'll say. If you don't want it, if you eat these and you think, oh, that was a little spicy, it's the chili paste making them a little spicy. So if you don't like that, then you can take that off. You can completely leave it out or reduce it and use less, okay? All right, I'm gonna take these out. Hold on one second, because I can't hear you over this sizzling. All right. We're going to turn off the heat so that I can deglaze the pan. I am going to use I love these, by the way. These are the comfort turners that Fistler makes, and they are wonderful. I am using white wine to deglaze my pan, a third of a cup, which is about five tablespoons. Sure. Uh huh. Hold on one second. All right, what were they doing? It wasn't up to pressure. You can't, you cannot open the pressure cooker if it's up to pressure. So it was probably close to boiling and so she opened it, gave it a good stir and closed it back down so that it would, um, so that it would build pressure. If you ever have trouble with your pressure cooker coming up to pressure, then take the lid off because it's not up to pressure. So take the lid off, it's probably boiling away. Give whatever's in there a good stir to kind of agitate it. Does that make sense? To kind of agitate the, the, um, the mixture in there, the sauce or whatever the liquid is. All right, now we're gonna dump the rest of our sauce in. And then put the lid back on and it should pop right up to pressure then. Okay. All right, we're just gonna give this a stir. 
Did we get everything in there? I think we did, didn't we? I put my one in my one three inch cinnamon stick. If you don't have cinnamon stick, I think you could certainly add a half a teaspoon to a teaspoon of cinnamon and you would be just fine. And I know that that seems totally weird, but it really does add a really nice flavor to these chicken wings. I think it's what makes them different. And now we're just gonna put our little drumettes back in there. We're gonna stir them, kinda coat them in the sauce. Biggest thing to remember with pressure cookers is there has to be liquid in the pot because it has to, that's the only way it's gonna build pressure is from the steam off the liquids. Okay. All right, so we've got that on high heat and now we're just gonna lock our lid in place and it's gonna come up. I'm gonna move this stuff out of the way and then we're gonna make our side dish and we're gonna use the, we're gonna save the sesame seeds and the scallions are going to go on top of our wings when they get done. So I'm gonna move this out of the way. Yep. That's fine, that's fine. It didn't like moving it off that, that high heat. All right, we're just gonna kind of move this off to the side and we're going to, let's talk about the next recipe in your handout. The next recipe is the roasted portobellos with kale and quinoa. This was another one of those recipes that I found on that, that diet website. Um, I wanna talk to you first about what I did with the mushrooms. The dressing here at the top the apple cider vinegar, the honey, the garlic, the olive oil, salt and pepper to taste, and then one 16 ounce package of the sliced baby portobello mushrooms. That's what I have here and I marinated these overnight um, in the refrigerator, okay? So what I'm gonna do here is I'm actually gonna put them, I've got my oven is hot, it's at 400 degrees. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and get our mushrooms roasting in the oven, cause they're roasted. Now the original recipe of this called for, for you to take the big portobello mushrooms, the caps, and you do the same thing. You marinate them and then when we make our kale mixture and our quinoa mixture, you actually would pile it on top of the portobello cap and you serve it on the side of whatever you're making. Um, obviously that's very difficult to get that many huge portobello caps and feed this many people. And, um, and it was also a little more difficult for my kids to handle. And so I thought, well, why couldn't I do the same thing? Just use the sliced and then stir it all together and make it almost like a stir fry kind of thing. And so that's where this came from. But I did want to tell you, you could certainly use the big portobello caps and you do the same, same technique. All right, that one does not want to come across. The biggest thing with roasting vegetables is you want to make sure that each one has their own personal space. You don't want them touching the other pieces of vegetables because Cooking surface is everything when you roast vegetables, so just make sure you don't overcrowd them. All right, you can see we're already coming up to pressure here. That pot over there with the soup in it was really full. I did get two really big sweet potatoes. If I had gotten two like medium sweet potatoes, we probably would have been fine. All right, so I'm just gonna pop that in for 10 minutes and let that roast. Okay, these are up to pressure. Now the nice thing about my Fistler induction burners is I have a timer on here. So I'm gonna set my timer for eight minutes. And what's awesome is that when that eight minutes is up, it's actually gonna turn off 
all by itself. It'll beep at me and then it'll turn off. But I'm gonna turn this down to like a three is what I'm gonna turn that down to. You can go ahead and pull these rolls out. Um, so now that, do you see how, I mean, you can't hear it and it's completely up to pressure. They're cooking away the way that you release the pressure. The steam goes away from your hand, so you're never worried about burning yourself. Even if you did get in the steam, it actually goes through a process in the handle so that it's not hot when it comes out, so that you're not going to burn yourself, okay? Um, you can't, can't get the lid off, can't push the button all the way in because there's pressure, um, so you would have to release all that pressure before it would unlock and you could take the lid off, okay? So we're going to cook these for... It was eight minutes, right? 10, no, eight, yes. Eight minutes in the pressure cooker. Then we're gonna release the pressure, take the lid off, we're gonna turn it up to high, and we're gonna let it simmer, boil, for 10 minutes until that sauce completely reduces down and it gets ooey, gooey, sticky all over those wings. And then we'll dump them out and we'll top them with the scallions and the, um, the sesame seeds, okay? which you could leave that off too if you wanted to. It's totally up to you. You know, you guys have heard me say before, you know, I don't do, I don't usually do pretty food, but it sure does taste good. Um, my brother, he's the one that does pretty food. I'm trying to get better though, I'm trying to get better. Gotta do something if I'm gonna make it on the Food Network one day, right? Just kidding. All right, next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna start cooking our kale. So I'm gonna get another burner here and get started. Actually, I take that back. We may have a burner situation here in a few minutes because that soup is not cooperating with me. How much longer does the soup have, Karen? Three minutes? Okay, we're doing all right then. Then I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna get the quinoa started then. I'm gonna talk to you about, this is another one of, this is actually one of my favorite pots too. This is one of the sizes that I started off with. This is the 2.5 liter skillet. It's got the waffled bottom. What's really cool is this actually, this pot comes in a set. The six liter stock pot that I used the soup for, you can get, it's called the Quattro set. It's the small Quattro set. It comes with the six liter stock pot and it comes with the 2.5 liter brazier. It comes with a glass lid that fits both pots because they're the same width here, uh, the same diameter pot. They just, one's short and one's tall. Um, and then they come with the pressure lid that they share, the glass lid, and then they also come with an insert and a stand, which I'll show you those in just a little bit because we're gonna use them in one of the recipes. Um, this is a nice starter set, especially if there's only two to four of you in your family. The six liter stock pot is certainly big enough to do a nice big pot of soup or a whole chicken with stock and things like that. And then the smaller one is perfect for doing chicken breasts or a small batch of wings or a side dish or rice or vegetables, something like that. Um, because pressure cooking is so fast, it's okay that you only have one pressure lid. Do your dish that cooks the longest first take the pressure lid off, put the glass lid on top. Because you're cooking at such a high pressure, it's a lot hotter um, than what you're used to cooking at. So the food stays hot for a very long time. You can then move your pressure lid over to your other pressure cooker and cook your side dish that's only gonna take 10 or 15 minutes to cook. And your other, your main dish is still very, very hot. So that's a really great, um, a great starter package. Do you hear it hissing just a little bit? It's gone over pressure, so I'm just gonna release a little pressure and reduce my heat. All right, when my timer goes off in about five minutes, Karen, if you, when my timer goes off in about five minutes, if y'all can pull the mushrooms out and just put them in a glass bowl for me to add to this in a minute, all right? So let's get our quinoa started. Yes. I am. Yes, when you're pushing this to release the pressure, yeah, you're watching this indicator. It slowly sinks back down. 
And when it gets right there to this, that second ring, then I can, I can let go. And now I'm down to a two. I mean, so that tells you, like I said, now it totally depends on how full your pot is. The bigger pots they are, if they're only half full, then you're probably gonna need to be on a little bit higher heat to maintain that pressure because there's, there's, a, there's a lot more void space in there. Um, so it's just something that you just have to play around with and every stove is different and gas is different from electric and all that kind of stuff. Yes? Not typically, no, because the, the pounds of pressure is still the same. So no, typically if you have less in there, you're not going to decrease the cook time. And I've noticed that maybe if I do, let's say I did three chicken breasts here, covered them in barbecue sauce, a little bit of water to produce some steam, that's only gonna cook for seven minutes and they're gonna be completely done. If I piled my chicken breasts on top and did like five or six in there, I might would increase my cook time eight, nine minutes total instead of seven. So you're only adding a little bit more for that act for the extra food. But typically if you do less, no, you're not gonna you're not gonna reduce, you know, what whatever I give you, that's gonna be kind of the starting point. And if you put more in the pot, you may need to increase your, your cook time. The cool thing about pressure cookers though is if you bring the pressure down and the chicken breasts aren't done, we'll agitate that heat in there, put the lid back on, put it back on high, and it'll pop right back up to pressure. And then you just cook it another couple minutes. It won't take very long to come up to pressure at that point because it's so hot in there. Does that make sense? Okay. So with the quinoa, quinoa actually is gonna, the quinoa peel off recipe is actually on the next page. We're gonna cook our, cook our quinoa. We're gonna get our pan getting warm here. Get our olive oil in there. Do you see them there? Our soup is done, so they're releasing all of the pressure so that they can serve that to you guys. I'm gonna get my garlic minced here for my quinoa. And then this is one cup of quinoa that I actually rinsed yesterday, and so it's ready to go. Quinoa has a little bit of a bitter, a bitter taste, so you want to rinse it when you're cooking it like this. All right. And then I laid it out and dried it, because mm -hmm. I didn't want it to start sprouting or anything. So I rinsed it off and then laid it out on a paper towel so that it could dry completely and then put it back in a bowl. All right, there's my timer for, my, for our chicken wings. I'm just gonna let them, they're fine sitting there like that. All right, so there's my garlic and my olive oil. Now there goes my quinoa. I love quinoa when I am tired of rice. It's just, it's, it's the same but different, if that's possible. Um, you can use it in places where you would normally, like as a side dish where you would normally have rice. You can have quinoa in its place and it just, it, it's just a little different. It's nice, it's a change. It's a little lighter than rice is, I think. So we're gonna turn our heat up on that. We are going to salt and pepper this. And then I'm going to use our, this is one of our dip mixes. And if you guys have come to our classes at all, you know how much mom and I absolutely love these. This is our eat your vegetables. I'm gonna add my cup of broth here. Thank you. Just 
gonna kind of give this a stir, make sure I get all that quinoa down from the side. Yes, here is our roasted mushrooms. Can y'all smell them? <clears throat> Thank you. All right, and now I'm going to use three to four tablespoons of the Eat Your Vegetable Seasoning Mix. The great thing about these mixes, if you have not used them before, is they are just dehydrated herbs and spices and vegetables. There's no MSG, no preservatives. There's no salt in them either, so just remember that when you use them in your cooking, you do want to salt your food. All right. And now, quinoa cooks so fast. It is crazy, but we're going to go ahead and we're going to bring this up to pressure. We are going to pressure it for one minute. And then we're going to turn it off and we're gonna let it naturally, naturally release, which is gonna take about 10 minutes or so, and then it's going to be done. It is, you're bringing it up to pressure on high, so it's, it's not gonna take long. And can you see the steam coming out here? That means it's boiling in there, and it's starting to build pressure, and then all of a sudden, the steam is going to stop. Did you see it do that? It just, the gasket just sealed. And so it locked, and now this is gonna start coming up, and you're gonna see it. Let's get our wings down. And you can see the, the button there. And it doesn't matter how hard I push this, I cannot get it completely unlocked until all of that pressure is down. Do you see this coming up already? One minute. The, the trickiest part about doing classes is, like this is figuring out when to start which component of the dish. Um, but I will tell you that if you will take a few minutes and plan a little bit ahead of time at home that way and figure out, okay, this takes the longest to cook, so I'm gonna start it now. It will make cooking dinner a whole lot easier. All right, now we're just gonna turn these up. These do not like it if they get wet and it has water, I had water on the side, so. Okay, the timer went off on this one, and so there it's, the heat has stopped, which y'all know this about induction burners, that it's not, it's all by magnetism, and so, like I can set paper there, I could turn it on, and it's not going to burn, because it's all by magnetism. There's actually, there's not a heat source, if that makes sense. All right, so we're gonna turn that off. We're gonna let that come down I'm gonna move it over here. I'm gonna put this here, and we're gonna turn this up to high, and we're gonna let it start boiling, and we're just gonna kinda of toss our wings in here. I'm gonna get rid of our cinnamon stick now. He's done his job. So I'm just gonna give our wings a little bit of a stir. Yes, I will move it over just a little. Is that good? All right. I'm gonna move our quinoa off the heat completely so that we can get our kale going. Fissler also makes a line of fry pans that are wonderful. All right, 
Let me flip back over to my kale recipe. So now what we're going to do is we're going to saute our red onions and our kale. Biggest thing with the wings, because you've got it on high and you're boiling and simmering and reducing this sauce down, you just want to stir it every once in a while so that nothing gets stuck to the bottom. All right, we've got our red onion. We're gonna put our onion and our garlic in there and let them start cooking down. I have absolutely fallen in love with kale. I am using it in all kinds of places and absolutely loving it. Like I said, I may have to do that frittata recipe for you one day, maybe on a class this summer. Or if you're on Facebook, like us on Facebook, maybe I'll just share that recipe on Facebook one day because it is really good. In fact, my husband, like I said, he's a fireman and he called me the other day from work. It was about 10 o'clock in the morning. He said, we haven't had breakfast yet here at the station. They'd been running calls all morning long. And he said, and I'm really in the mood for that frittata, and I just went to the grocery store and got everything I needed. So how do I make that recipe? So, and uh, they had it for breakfast. Actually, I guess it was more like brunch at that point. All right. All right, so I've got my garlic and my oil going here. Let's get our, these are thinly sliced red onion. go. Turn that up just a little. Are y'all enjoying the soup? How is it? Isn't that good? <laughs> Cameraman in the back is giving a thumbs up. I made that I made, I've made it at home several times. And so then I brought some of my leftovers in and let everybody here try it. And they're like, oh yeah, this is good, this is good. And then, um, but every time at home I had made it, I already had chicken, like leftover from when we had done baked chicken. And so I had done the soup and then added the chicken as an afterthought. And so this week I realized I really need to test this recipe out, throwing it all in there and coming up with a cooking time because I wanted to show you guys how to do it all at the same time, all in one pot, not having to cook anything separately. And so I had to make a big pot of it. I guess it was on, I think it was on Tuesday. And uh, my sister-in-law was out and about running errands with her, my little nephew, Charlie, and they stopped in and I said, hey, I'm about, to, I'm about to cook lunch. Stay and have some soup and tell me what you think. And then my sister and brother-in-law, um, they were out running errands and I sent them a text and I said, stop by, I just made a pot of soup. So they came by and ate and then everybody here at the store ate as well. So we all enjoyed that soup a lot. And there was about two bowls left and I got a text from my husband and said, you better be bringing that home for me to have for lunch tomorrow. So. But like my, I said, my kids, they actually really enjoy that recipe a lot. All right, so now we're just going to kind of toss our kale. This was about, this is about six cups chopped. And it probably is one and a half bunches. The, they, the bunches of kale at the grocery store lately have been really small. Um, so I would maybe go ahead and get, go ahead and get two. And um, then if you have some extras, shoot me an email, I'll send you that frittata recipe and you can use the rest of it in that. What's that? Trader Joe's, they have the, like the bags. Well, and 
I'll tell you, Publix has them too. Publix and Kroger have the big bags of already chopped kale. What I find is they leave the stem in there and that's very gross. So I like buying, um, I like buying the fresh bunches and then I, you de-stem them and then you can chop them. And if you wrap them, just like with any of your other greens and lettuces and salads and, and herbs even, um, if you will wash them and then dry them, wrap them in a paper towel and put them down in a Ziploc bag really and push all the air out of them, they'll keep. They'll keep for a week or two. Um, in the refrigerator, yes. Go ahead and de-stem them and, um, and then wrap them in a paper towel to keep the moisture away from them and they'll keep. Look at our, do you see our wings? Yeah, the guys, I've already made a batch this morning of these and the, the boys were like, what is that I smell already? Okay, I am going to add just the littlest bit of water to this just to steam them up a little bit. I'm gonna get our glass lid here just to finish cooking those. And then we're gonna finish these up. Will you actually, will you go ahead and dump those into there for me and I will just pour these right on top. Do you see how our sauce has completely thickened in there? I hope you guys like these as much as we have. I think that if you did this with um, chicken strips and go, went ahead and chunked them and cooked it the same way, I think you could reduce your cooking time greatly. If you did chunks of chicken, only cook them for about four minutes if you did chunks and then take the lid off and reduce the sauce. Um, the biggest thing about chicken when you're pressure cooking is that you can cook them too long and they will get chicken breasts and chicken strips and things like that will get rubbery. I notice it's not as bad when it's on the bone. I think on the bone there's so much moisture there that it's hard to overcook them and the meat will just start falling off the bone is what will happen. But um, I'm going to turn this off because our heat is good. Our sauce is good on this. Um, but with chicken breasts and strips and if you've got ch chunks of chicken, you can overcook them and they'll get rubbery. Whereas beef and red meats, roasts and things like that, the longer you cook them, the more tender they get. Um, pot roast, go ahead and shoot us an email or go on our website on our video page. You can go to, we've got lots of pressure cooking classes on there and the handouts should be there for you to print them and get all those recipes off. Um, there's just a lot of really good stuff. Okay. All right, this is almost ready. And can you, when you bring that over, will you bring my mushrooms too, please? We got a lot of stuff going on here, don't we? That's all right. There's the ones that I did earlier. I'm just gonna pour these on top. The, I did another batch of wings earlier for y'all. Because what I wanted to do, you know, cooking this many wings, if I had cooked all of them at the same time, I would have needed to do it in one of my big pots. And that would have just been a pain, trying to braise them in a deep pot like that. And I wanted to show you the braising technique. And, well, I mean, some of you may be making 50 wings at one time, but probably not. You're probably gonna be doing two packages. The drummets usually come 10 to a package. Um, and I did five packages. So I did three this morning and got it all cleaned up and then did two more packages just now. So I wanted to show you that. All right, now we're just gonna top them with our sesame seeds and they're gonna stick to it because that glaze is hot. And then we're going to 
just take a couple of scallions and we're going to cut those. just the green part. Let me ask, does in, did anybody see this recipe in this picture on Facebook last week? Yeah, those were gone in about five minutes, that whole plate of them. Did not take long, they were gone. The kale is on like a four. We're just gonna turn that off now. And I'm going to take my mushrooms. Those were our roasted mushrooms. Now, what you would normally do and how the original recipe read was you have your big mushroom caps and you put them on your plate and then you put your kale, your stir fried kale you would take it out with a, with a set of tongs and pile it on top of your mushroom, your roasted mushroom. Like I said, I felt like this was gonna be a little bit more service friendly for my kids. And then I'm always looking at ways to get other grains into their diet. Here is Karen. Here's that pressure cooker that I'm gonna need back. Um, I wanna move the quinoa back so that Jim can get it in the camera. Can y'all see that? Our quinoa is totally cooked. But I'm always looking, so you usually just fluff this up, I'm always looking at ways to get grains into my kids. You know, my mom's philosophy is every day, every way. So, like I said, the original recipe was big portobello caps with the kale piled on top. Well, then when I did the the, ba the sliced baby portobellas, I went, hmm, why couldn't I cook up some kale and toss it all together like a stir fry and have it on the side? We actually had, the night that I did this, we had it with salmon and it was oh so good. My kids are very brave. They, they try stuff all the time for me. I cannot complain, they are not, they're really not picky eaters at all. Okay, so what we're gonna do, that and my nonstick. There's that. Isn't that pretty though? All right, and now you guys get to enjoy it. Olivia, you wanna come grab this? So we're gonna serve the sticky wings with the, uh, the kale and mushroom quinoa peel off, stir fry, whatever you wanna call it. Mixture on the side, there you go. Delicious lasagna pan, yes. Yes, ma'am. That mixture, I did four big caps, but I mean, there was plenty of that juice. As long as you kept tossing them and turning in them so that they got good and marinated, you could probably do four to eight big mushroom caps. And then if you did the six, that's a lot of kale. I mean, that, that was a, that's a big dish. A, a big side dish for sure. And of course you could reduce it and do, you know, smaller amounts if it's just two of you. Um, but that kale, I'll, I will tell you, the stir fry stores beautifully in the refrigerator and it's actually pretty good cold too. The acidity from that apple cider vinegar is, it's really, I mean, it almost gives it a coleslaw 
type thing going on. But I, I can be weird like that sometimes. So if you try it and you go, I do not know why she liked that so much. That's all right. Okay, let's get this cleaned up a little bit and we will, we will move on. All right, so did you enjoy the soup? Yes, what did you think of the rolls? Not bad for frozen for a couple of months. You wouldn't know. No, you wouldn't. And um, I, I take that back. I think I only have two bags of rolls in my freezer now because I'm pretty sure my husband confiscated one and took it to the fire station so that he could have rolls whenever he wanted. So, all right, let me get some of this stuff moved off of here and then we will move on. How are we doing on time? Oh, wow, I'm actually doing really good. Sometimes I amaze even myself. Okay, I'm really excited for you to try these. And I'm pretty sure, well, huh, this is my plate, obviously. All right, the next recipe that we are going to do, does anybody have questions up to this point? Are we all doing good? Yes, ma'am. Yes, her question was the set that I talked about, the Quattro set, can you purchase an additional lid? Yes, and we, yes, we sell those. We're waiting for them to come in. Um, but yes, we can get additional lids so that if, you know, you go, you know what, enough of this sharing lids thing, I know that this is something that I wanna do and I re really enjoy using these, then you can move on. Jim, I'm gonna come to the front, you know, mm, no, I'm not. I'm going to get this started and then I'll come to the front and talk about um, some other sizes and things like that. Okay, next recipe. I'm going to move my burners off to the side so I have a place to work here. Next recipe is meatloaf with cheddar smashed potatoes and carrots. All right. This recipe, it's a combination of a couple of recipes. We carry several pressure cooking cookbooks out in the store that you can look at. One particular set of books. Um, oh, thank you. She read my mind. <clears throat> are all of these by Lorna? Yes, they are. All three of these books are by an author. Uh, her name's Lorna Sass. She actually came and did a cooking class years ago. Um, when we held our cooking classes in there, when this was our warehouse. Um, and she has three really great pressure cooking cookbooks. This one, Pressure Perfect, um, it's a good starter one. It has just some good classic recipes, normal recipes that you're used to, to cooking. You're just used to doing it on the stovetop or in the oven, and she shows you how to do it in the pressure cooker, so it's really good. Probably one of my favorites though, and this next recipe that we're gonna do, um, I believe is in this cookbook. It's over 75 one pot meals in minutes. And she shows you how to make a complete meal all in the same pot, which is really cool. And then this is, um, her, this is a complete vegetarian cookbook that's really good as well. So all of those are available. Um, we've got I think we've got, do we have any other pressure? These are the only three pressure cooking cookbooks now, are these three, and they're, but they're all very, very good. I think you'll enjoy any one of them. Um, this is what I'm looking for. Okay, each pressure cooker, depending on if it's big or it's small, comes with a perforated, this is called an insert, okay? It will come with this, and it will also come with See if I can get this lid off without knocking over my ingredients. No. Okay. It will come with a stand and with an insert basket, okay? And I forgot to tell you all to hold on to your forks and spoons um, as they bring you guys your food the rest of the class. But it will come with a stand and it will come with an insert. And this allows you to layer your cooking, okay? And they call it, um, tri-level, bi-level cooking is what they call it. And this is her cookbook that has 75 one-pot meals. 
she has you stacking your different dishes on top of each other, okay? And that's what we're gonna do for this next dish. I'm gonna get my, I am using the big boy. This is a 10 inch pressure cooker, a 10 inch, a 10 liter, 10 liter pressure cooker. I'm going to go ahead and start getting my pot warm on kind of a medium heat. I also am cheating just a little bit because I have warm water already ready for me. I'm going to put a little bit of water down here in the bottom, okay? And then we're going to get started on building this recipe. All right, so let's start with our meatloaf and get it completely assembled here. I've got three pounds of ground beef. I do not like working with my wedding rings and ground beef. How do y'all like the, the wings and the stir fry? All right, so we're gonna put our ground beef here. Then we've got our eggs. Whoop. So this is a combination of Lorna's recipe and my recipe. <clears throat> I typically do an egg with every pound of ground beef. We may need to give them more napkins <laughs> in a few minutes. When I served those sticky wings to my kids the first time, I gave them the, each their own wash rag to go along with it. All right, now we've got our onion. This is the Garlic of Eaton seasoning mix. You guys are awfully quiet, but then I'm looking up and I'm seeing people pull chicken legs out of their mouth. I'm going ahead and using this entire package in there. Now remember what I said. Those seasoning mixes have no salt in them. The garlic of Eaton, what is in that one? The garlic of Eaton, oh, let's see, is roasted garlic, dehydrated of course, roasted garlic, onion, tomato, rosemary, oregano, pepper, and spices. Okay. Obviously, garlic is the predominant flavor there. All right, and pepper. Uh, no, it already has pepper in that one. Okay, so now I'm just going to get my hands in it. Can you do me a favor? Will you come here? <laughs> now that my hands are all nasty, will you open this chili sauce for me? <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. All right, and then we're just going to add this. You could use ketchup. You could use chili sauce. Um, you could use, I should have taken my bracelet off. Um, too bad I'm right-handed. <laughs> um, you could use barbecue sauce. At home, I really like to use barbecue sauce on my meatloaf. It, I think it just, it adds a totally different flavor to it. And to be honest with you, growing up, I did not care for my mom's meatloaf. Meatloaf was that one dish that I kind of ate until I was like just barely full, and then that was it, you know? It was not my favorite meal. Um, then I had meatloaf at my boyfriend's house and his mom's meatloaf was fantastic. And um, so came home telling my mom, um, Chris's mom, his, her meatloaf is better than yours. 
So she called and said, what do you do to your meatloaf? And she said, I just put barbecue sauce in it instead of ketchup. Made all the difference in the world. I like using the chili sauce too, though. It's really good. All right, so you just want to make sure that all those, those herbs and everything are good and mixed in. I'm going to move this stuff off. All right, so what I'm going to do is I've got my perforated insert, okay, because I want, as that meatloaf starts cooking, I want those natural juices to ooze down and drop out. I don't want it to sit and cook in it. Okay, so now I'm just going to press this in here. Spread a little bit of this on top. Hey, while your hands are dirty, mine as well, right? No sense in dirtying up a spoon. Get your kids to do this job. All right, now we get to wash. Did you like that? <laughs> I was missing you. Where did you go? You left the class and then you just got back. You were shopping, weren't you? Okay, you were shopping in the store. Then that's allowed. You're allowed to leave the class if you're shopping. I'm kidding. All right. Yes, ma'am. If you, if you, no, I don't believe so. You might want to check, her question was if you shape the meatloaf differently, like if you made meatballs or something like that, did it affect the cooking time? I'm sure it would affect the cooking time because you have smaller pieces that you're cooking then. Um, I would maybe refer to one of the, one of the cookbooks. And it does come with, an, the owner's manual has like some suggested cooking times for things. Um, so I would maybe just look at that and see if there's a meatball recipe in one of the cookbooks. There probably is. Okay, so now what we're going to do, I'm going to move this now into the camera. And I'm going to get our potatoes. So I've got water down in there. Now I've got our potatoes. And I'm just going to put our potatoes right down in the pot. Now, the greatest part about cooking potatoes in a pressure cooker as opposed to a regular pot, I am going to add a little more water to this, though. And I'm going to go ahead and start, I'm going to turn up our heat to high to get it really nice and hot in there. You only want to about half cover potatoes with water. You're not going to completely submerge them in water. Um, Number one is, oh, now I need to put my rings back on. Um, before I lose those, I'd be in so much trouble. Um, the reason you don't want to completely cover your potatoes is you don't want to waterlog them and then pour all the water off because then you're having to add all kinds of other ingredients to make your potatoes taste good again. Um, so the nice thing about pressure cooking is you don't have to completely submerge them in water. You just need enough liquid in there to produce steam to build pressure to cook them in. So I'm just going to salt them and pepper them. Now normally if I was not going to do potatoes in the bottom, all right, let's talk about that for just a second. If I was not going to do potatoes in the bottom here, then what I would most likely do is I would use my stand and I, I would put my two cups of water in the bottom, I'd put my stand, and then I would place my meatloaf right on top so that the meatloaf is up out of the water and it's almost like a steaming process is what's going on there, okay? Now, but because I've got my potatoes in here, let's do this. Now, I don't particularly like aluminum foil touching my food. So I will just cover that with a little bit of wax paper. What's that? Aluminum foil touching my food because aluminum has been linked back to so many problems 
health problems in this country. Um, it's more predominant when you're boiling and cooking food in aluminum cookware. Um, but also just trying to be mindful because other people have stronger convictions and so it's easy in a class to put a piece of wax paper over there. Okay, now, and I'm actually gonna show you how to do this later on too. Let's see. All right, now, I wonder how I'm gonna get this out. I did that backwards. This is not the part that I cover. All right, has little handles. I'm just gonna set this right down on top. There we go, that's on high. Now we are going to get our, now this is what we're gonna do. It's been a long time since I've done it tri-leveled like this. I'm gonna lay this piece of wax paper right there on top. Okay, now what I'm gonna do is I'm going to build a little basket for our carrots. Now, carrots do not take nearly as long ooh, as meatloaf does. Potatoes do not take very long, but because I'm mashing them, it doesn't matter if they get, if they over steam in there, I'm mashing them anyway, so it doesn't matter. So what I'm gonna do here, I've got a couple tablespoons of butter and some honey granules. I'm just gonna plop that down just like that. And then I'm gonna take our zester. And I know I've shown you all this before about how I used to zest food used to go like this and then I would have to stop and look and rotate and then dreamy Lars showed us how to do it this way we saw Lars um, we go every spring to the International Houseware show up in Chicago I'm sure y'all have heard mom and dad talk about we go to Chicago and we find new product every year and um, this year was kind of exciting because we were actually working a booth in Chicago. We were working the, the mixer booth, Anka Shroom Original Mixer. We were working that booth, um, and we were working with, with several different friends. My friend Christian in Denmark, he's actually the, Denmark, the uh, distributor in Denmark for the mixer, and that's how we met him. And, um, and then another good friend, Lynn Junk, she's the distributor in Canada for the mixer. And... Um, I kept telling them, oh, we need to go to the Fistler booth because she, uh, Lars will be cooking over there and you guys have to taste the food. It was all about the food. But my dad kept insisting that we were going over there to see Dreamy Lars. So now we're just going to kind of wrap this up. Now, like I said, carrots do not take this long to cook, but by wrapping them in the tin foil, it actually will slow down their cooking. And I'm just gonna kinda flatten it out so it'll fit in there. And I'm just gonna lay it right on top of the meatloaf. And now everything is going to cook all together in the same pot. The potatoes, like I said, we're mashing them, so it doesn't matter that they're gonna cook for 40 minutes. The meatloaf is gonna steam and cook here in the basket. The drippings from the meat are gonna fall down into the potatoes, making them extra yummy. And then the carrots wrapped in the aluminum foil here, they're gonna cook very, very slowly wrapped in that aluminum foil. And so they will be perfectly done at the end as well. All right, so everybody always asks, why in the world would I want a giant pressure cooker for this reason right here? 
the taller it is, the more things that you can stack in there. Now, obviously, the small little six liter pot comes with an insert as well, and it's about this big, and you could certainly do about a pound and a half meatloaf in there. So if you do have a smaller family, you can do this same process, just smaller amounts of food in there. So we're gonna let this go. I'm gonna actually come down front while this comes up to pressure um, and show you a couple other pot ideas and selections and then um, we'll move on to our next dish. What time am I supposed to be over? One o'clock, right? I have an hour and a half. What do I have left to do? Oh yeah, I'm doing good. Okay. See, I told you, I just never know how fast this is going to go. Okay, so we've talked about the small, um, actually, can we like, let's bring them all back out. You've got the six liter, right? Mm. Okay, so we've got probably my favorite, my favorite choices are, here is the, this is your small quattro set, okay? You've got your six liter stock pot and your 2.5 liter brazier, like I said, comes with the glass lid, the pans share the pressure lid. It comes with an insert, the little perforated insert, and it comes with a stand, okay? So there's your quattro, your small quattro set, all right? Then you've got your large quattro set, which is actually right here on the table. Um, here's the glass lid. Here's the perforated insert, the stand. This is the eight liter stock pot. And then it comes with the 4.5 liter brazier. And this is considered the larger Quattro set. Um, they just came out with these at the first of the year, right? First of the year was when they introduced this set because that set was so popular. But then people were wanting, well, I wanna build a set, but out of the bigger pots. And so they decided to put these together. Um, this has probably become one of our other most popular it probably is our most popular seller as far as the sets, the pots, anything goes, is these. And then your other, another one that is very, very popular, this is the Nova Grill, it's the, the waffle bottom too, right? Um, is, it's called the Nova Grill, and it's the 4.5 liter brazier. Instead of the insert, the normal insert, it comes with this steaming basket to be able to steam vegetables and things like that. Um, it also comes with a glass lid, and it comes with, of course, the pressure lid. Um, and then this is the 10 liter. There is, this is the eight liter, the 10 liter. Is that the biggest size we have in the Fistlers? And that's the biggest size is the 10 liter. We also do sell the inserts. Um, there is the perforated kind, and then there is a solid one as well. Um, where I would use the solid insert is there's a recipe that I've done in the past. It's a smothered chicken recipe where I do potatoes. It's the tri-level cooking. Do the potatoes in the bottom, put the stand in, and then I use the solid bottom insert to put my chicken strips. And then I make my own cream of chicken soup, pour that over it with some herbs and some slivered um, onions, and then cooked it all in there at the same time, and it's a smothered chicken and the, the potatoes on, their, on the bottom. I've also done rice in the bottom and done it that way as well. So those are just some of your options as far as pressure cookers go. After the class, we will be more than happy to talk to you about, okay, what's the size of your family? What kind of foods do you cook? Do you do soups? Then you're probably gonna want a stock pot. You know, do you wanna just start off, start slow? Um, then we can we can help you figure out which sizes are going to be best. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Yes, very good question, Faye. Um, her question was with the rice in the bottom. Rice cooks for 20 minutes in a pressure cooker. The chicken, obviously, you don't want to cook it that long because remember we talked about chicken gets rubbery. That's where you would top it with the the aluminum foil and being enclosed like that, it won't overcook. So, all right.
Um, her question was, did I use the stand? No, I did not because the potatoes would have been over the stand anyway. So no, I did not use the stand. I would have used the stand if I wasn't doing the potatoes at all. If I was just doing the meatloaf by itself in there, then I would have put the stand, put my two cups of water, put the stand and put the meatloaf right on top. So there, there are some places you don't have to use the stand because the potatoes are lifting it high enough. Do you see we've got steam coming here? If you will get your burner back out, I'm gonna let the meatloaf go over there, hang out with you while I do our next two dishes. All right, the next two recipes we're actually gonna do side by side. <clears throat> Thank you. Let me make sure I remember how long our meatloaf is supposed to go. Da -da 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 -da. Did I put it in there? It's not 10 minutes, I'll tell you that right now. It's 35 for a three pound, for a three pound meatloaf, it's 35 minutes. So make that adjustment. Oh, I, I know what it was. It's because, it's because her recipe was for a one pound meatloaf. And I went, who wants to do a one pound meatloaf? My family of five, three children, two adults will eat a three pound meatloaf and maybe have a little bit left over for leftovers the next day. So 35 minutes on the meatloaf. There again, if you open it up and it needs to cook a little longer, just pop that lid back on, it'll pop right back up to pressure, add like five more minutes, yes. Yes, yes, her question was, can you do this recipe in the eight liter? Um, yes, you can. You just might would need to do less potatoes so that you can still stack everything. But yes, you sure can. All right, let me get this stuff out of the way. 10 minutes is for one pound meatloaf, yes. About 20 minutes for a two pound meatloaf. Do you see where we're going? 30 to 35 minutes for a three pound meatloaf. Okay, yes. That's the 10 liter. That's the 10 liter that I did the, the three pound meatloaf. And that was actually five pounds of potatoes, not three. Just because I went ahead and had her just cut all of them. Okay. And those were, I think, Yukon Golds is the kind that I got. Okay, so we're gonna do two recipes side by side. These you have, if you have come to a pressure cooking class in the past, then you have probably already seen this, these recipes, but they're just, they're too good not to do them again. And they're so easy. Um, I was telling somebody the other day, there are a few things that go on vacation with us to Florida, to the beach every year. Sorry, I've got to wash my hands. And I've gotten flour in my nose. Um, there are a few things that go to the beach with us. One is my electric griddle to cook pancakes on. That goes. Um, and the other thing is my pressure cooker. Um, and last year I took two because we cook we get, usually our condo has a complete kitchen. We only go out to dinner a couple of nights while we're on vacation and we cook the rest of the time. Take, we grocery shop when we get down there and, um, and we just eat, you know, in the room. And so my pressure cooker goes with me because we are on vacation. And yes, I do want to still feed my family healthy while we're gone, um, but I don't want to be spending all my time cooking because it feels like that's all I do anyway, the, all the rest of the time. So. This is actually one of our favorite recipes um, at the beach. Goodness gracious, I have gotten something. My mom would say, it's that dang nose ring. Um, but anyway, sorry, personal problem. Um, but this is one of our favorite recipes to do at the beach because it's so fast and it's so easy. So. Let's get our pressure cookers getting warm. Put 
There we go. All right, so your two recipes that you've got, and I meant for them to be positioned in the handout so that they were side by side when you opened up, up but they're, you're just going to have to flip back and forth. Um, but let's st actually start with the skillet, the speedy skillet pasta. Let's start with that one. Let me get my tray up here. This is actually Lorna Sass. When I was looking through one of her cookbooks, I noticed that she had you cooking your pasta in the pressure cooker, like adding enough extra liquid that you could put your dry pasta in there and cook it all in there together. And I went, whoa, wait a minute. And then we had a customer that submitted a recipe. Um, it was Elaine Benson so submitted this recipe for the 2007 holiday recipe collection. Um, she submitted the speedy skillet pasta and then my mom went, okay, why can't I take the elements of the speedy skillet pasta, combine it with Lorna's idea of cooking the dry pasta in the pressure cooker and make it a pressure cooker meal. And we probably, I make this probably once a week for the kids. Um, we just, we enjoy it that much. So I'm going to get my ground beef browning. What's that? This one is the four and a half liter skillet. Mm -hmm. It's the four and a half liter that comes with the, I'm sorry, four liter, sorry, four liter skillet that comes with the large quattro set. Okay. So we're going to let that, turn that up, let it brown. Okay. Now let's go over here and we're going to get our pressure cooker pasta alfredo going. Where's my cream? Okay. This is two cups of heavy cream. You could use half and half if you wanted to. You don't have to use the heavy cream, but it does make it really good. This is another one of those recipes that's just oh so easy, especially when the measurements are this way. Two cups of cream, four cups of broth. All right, we're going to get this getting hot and bubbly. We're going to salt and pepper this. And then secret ingredient that you would never think would go here, nutmeg. We're just going to whisk this together. Now this is our 100% brown rice pasta that we carry here in the store. Completely, it's gluten free. So if you need to go gluten free, these the brown rice pastas are wonderful. This is my my kids' favorite shape. Is the it's very similar to rotini. It's a fusilli. I'm probably totally not saying that right. In fact, I was laughing with. Um, with my friend Christian in Denmark yesterday, we were talking on Facebook because he was wanting to make sure on the time of the class, because over there it's like almost six o'clock at night right now. And, um, and I told him, I said, I pulled up on the internet to try and learn how to say something in Danish and decided that was a really bad idea. Really, really bad idea. And we were laughing so hard in the office that Jim, one of the owners, came out of his office and came to see what we were doing because obviously we were not working very hard. If we were laughing that hard because I was trying to repeat these Danish phrases and it just, it wasn't working. It was not working, but 
I tried. All right, so we're going to keep browning our ground beef. And this is actually really lean, so I'm not going to need to drain it off. All right, now it's going to finish cooking. Oh, I turned this so that you can't see the name. Have you ever noticed that on like the cooking channel? They'll have the word Publix scribbled out with a magic marker and you're like, I totally know that that's Publix's logo. Guess what my favorite sauce is? You can use whatever you like. The cool part about this recipe is it's a jar of spaghetti sauce and then you fill the jar with water and then your bag of pasta noodles and then give this a stir make sure that dry pasta is down in there nice covered. If you make your own pasta, you wouldn't need to do this. This is one of those things where when you're in a pinch and you need dinner, I always keep a couple of bags of dry pasta on hand, even though I, you know, I make my own pasta. All right, we're going to give this a quick stir. Now, the reason why this works is because we've got, with the cream and everything, normally you wouldn't be able to pressure cook a dairy cream like that. You would, but with the chicken broth added in there, it loosens it up enough that it will create steam. Um, and the same thing with the sauce. And earlier when I was talking about doing like barbecue chicken, if you use a really thick barbecue sauce, you may need to add a little bit of water in there to create some steam because not just because it's a liquid doesn't mean that it's going to produce steam once it gets hot. Does that make sense? And you don't want to burn your food or anything. So now what we're going to do is we're going to let both of these come up to pressure on high heat. We're going to pressure them for five minutes and then we're going to take the pressure down and to the Alfredo, I've got two cups of Asiago cheese that I'm going to add here and then to our speedy skillet pasta you could use ricotta or I like to just use cream cheese. I think it makes it a little bit creamier texture. We're going to mix in our cream cheese and then top it with shredded. Um, I had my sister shred a block of the raw milk. It was the yogurt, right? It was the, the yogurt cheese that we carry here in the store. And we're going to top that with the yogurt cheese and then we're going to serve both of these side by side. But do you see why I take my pressure cooker to the beach with me and why we do these two meals on a regular basis? I've also, I love to get the, um, I might be saying it wrong, the Armour uh, turkey meatballs from Publix. They have them um, and they're just in the, fro they're frozen meatballs and they're made from ground turkey. Um, I will buy those and I will use those in this recipe over here and I'll pour my frozen meatballs in there, top it with the sauce, put the water, put the dry noodles in there and lock it. There's no browning involved and you're going from frozen meatballs and that is still five minutes, even with them being frozen meatballs. And the kids really, they have really enjoyed that as well. Um, and this is something that you can do really quick and in a pinch. So this is one area where I do keep several bags of the brown rice pasta on hand all the time to be able to do these two dishes. My kids, my boys don't really call this Alfredo. They call it the best macaroni and cheese ever. Um, you could certainly do the long noodles like the fettuccine noodles. I would probably break them in half and lay them down in there if you wanted to do the noodles, but um, they really something about those spiral noodles and even the shells and the elbows because all the sauce gets all in 
the like nooks and crannies of the of the noodle and they're just both really really good um, you can see our steam is coming up on both of these throw this away we're doing really good I may even get you guys out of here early today and that doesn't happen very often at the bread beckers especially if mom's teaching the class I didn't say that and if you tell her I did I'll say you're a liar no I actually I do tell her all the time that she never ends on time it's like a little competition we have going on how many classes can I finish early or on time how many classes can she finish late? Yeah, you know, she has a lot to say though. I love my mom. She's great. She taught me everything I know. All right, we're gonna move this to the side. How much time do we have left on our meatloaf mashed potatoes? Twenty-eight. Okay. Well, maybe I won't get you out early. We'll be done cooking. You'll just be waiting on food to finish, <laughs> and that's okay. That's right. All right, both of these are going to come up to pressure. While we do that, go ahead and flip to the cheesecake recipe. Yum, yum, yum. Because I want to talk to you about something really cool that I did. You brought out a veggie culture, didn't you? Will you grab it for me off the table? I want to show you guys what I did. Thank you. You may go now. Thank you. <laughs> um, we have a fermentation class coming up in April, and it's going to be on kefir and yogurt making and cultured vegetables. That's one area of food that we do not eat in this country is a fermented product. Everywhere else in the world, they eat, you know, they either have kefir or they have yogurt or they have sauerkraut, cultured vegetables. Our Alfredo is up, so let me turn it down and set my timer. Hold that thought. This one's building pressure still. Um, but we're the only country, there it goes, the only country that doesn't really eat a fermented food. I truly believe that that's why we're having all the digestion issues that we're having in this country. We don't have all the good bacteria in our gut that helps break down foods and get where things where it needs to go. Then we are so heavily medicated and all those antibiotics that we're taking kill all of that good bacteria that's in our gut. And then we're not eating anything to put the good bacteria back in there. And then we're having just all kinds of problems after that. Issues with, <coughs> issues with um, food allergies, because our body can't digest and process normal, real foods. And it's, I really believe that it's part of the problem is that we don't have all of that good bacteria and we're not eating fermented and cultured foods. So, we're always trying to look for ways of getting cultured foods into our diet. I'll release a little bit of this pressure. And one of the ways that we have found, and if you've been to any classes lately and you've seen us make butter, um, we have taken, we carry a cultured vegetable starter. We also carry kefir starter. And then we also have yogurt starter as well. Um, the vegetable culture starter pack, what I did for y'all yesterday was I took a pint of heavy cream and I poured it into this jar and I sprinkled one packet of the vegetable culture starter into my heavy cream and I let it sit overnight. What this made, let me get a spoon so I can show you. What I made for you now is cultured cream or sour cream. But it's got all of your live active cultures in it. Now, what you can do with this is you can, <coughs> you can take this and you can put it in a double, a whipping bowl you would normally do egg whites, whipping cream, something like that in. And you can whip this 
past the point of whipped cream and you can make your own butter. Have you ever accidentally done that when you were whipping whipping cream and you whipped it too far and it actually started breaking back down? It almost looked like yellow sand is what it looks like. Um, if you keep going past that yellow sand point, you will actually make butter. The butter milk will come away from the butter. And so you can take this and you can make a cultured butter and a cultured buttermilk out of this. Now what I'm going to do for you today is because my mom's, oh, let's turn this down. My mom's cheesecake recipe calls for you to top it with sour cream and then strawberries on top of that. I figured why not make the cultured cream, the cultured sour cream here, and that would be, now you're getting your cultured product with dessert. I don't know anybody that would complain about that whatsoever. So that's what I've done for you today. So I've scooped off about a cup of sour cream here, and then in just a bit, we're gonna add a little bit of agave nectar and a little bit of vanilla to it to take away from that, because it is gonna be sour. I mean, it's got that tart, that tart flavor there. I'm gonna stick this back in the fridge and we'll use that to top our cheesecake in just a bit. There we go. Definitely sign up for the fermentation class. You're gonna I think you're really gonna enjoy it. I'm gonna teach you guys a lot of really cool stuff. I've actually been making, um, I've been kefir culturing juice. Instead of using the kefir culture on milk, my daughter Catherine actually is allergic to milk. And so it's already really hard for me to get um, a, a dairy protein and calcium and things like that into her system. And then it's really hard for her to even get a probiotic um, and those good that good bacteria because most of it is grown on milk and most of it is found in dairy products and so I'm actually able to use the kefir starter the kefir culture starter and I put it on juice 100% fruit juice and I culture my juice and she's able to drink that every morning um, and I tell you what because of our crazy schedule sometimes we're eating dinner at 9 and 10 o'clock at night and going right to bed which is not good for your digestion at all, but I have noticed I drink a half a cup of that kefir juice every morning before I have breakfast, and I drink a half a cup of it every night before I go to bed, and I have not had any, like sometimes when you eat late at night, you wake up the next morning and you just feel yucky because you went to bed on a full stomach. I have not had that feeling at all. I actually wake up much more refreshed, and I think it's because I really do believe that that good bacteria is helping break down and digest all of that food no matter at what point I eat it at night. All right, so our Alfredo is done, so we can actually start to quick release it. The thing is when you are dealing with dairy, it's a little bit messier. The steam coming out is a little bit messier when you're dealing with dairy, but it's fine. This could also be where you would do the cold water release method to make it go really fast. go and our skillet pasta only has like two minutes left so you guys are actually going to eat it before um, the meatloaf and mashed potatoes are all done Bryce probably get to have a dessert before the final meal too well I'll, I'll probably have them serve you your cheesecake beforehand should have maybe started the meatloaf earlier now I know if I ever do this class again I will 
totally just spit at me. It's like a llama. <clears throat> All right. Let the rest of the steam out here. Like I said, this is all right that it does this. It was kind of full. There we go. There we go. Let's do this. You all notice how much I absolutely love these comfort turners. They are shaped in a way that you can get all the way down to the corner of the pan. They're just fantastic. All right, so there is our Alfredo. Let's add our two cups of Asiago cheese. There's our skillet pasta just dinged at me. So now we're going to Fold this in. I've noticed when I use cheeses like the Asiago or Parmesan, things like that, I don't typically need to add any more salt to it because those cheeses are a little saltier. Um, but if I was just using like a mozzarella or, or even a cheddar, um, I would still probably go ahead and salt it just a little bit. Of course, it's to your taste, so it's whatever you want. All right. Do you see how creamy that is? That and if you had some grilled chicken and some steamed broccoli, just dump it all in there together. That'd be good. Good, good stuff. All right. I should quiz you. What's this release method called? Quick release. I heard it. Somebody, somebody's paying attention. All right. This one's just taking its sweet time coming down. gracious. There we go. There we are. Doesn't that look good? That's, in my opinion, that's better than hamburger a helper ever thought about being. But that's about, I mean, that's really, that's really what you're doing is making a hamburger helper type of dish. I don't know any kid who doesn't, wouldn't like that right there. All right. Now we'll just kind of, kind of chunk in our eight ounces of cream cheese. We're just going to stir this in. <clears throat> um, if you were going to do ricotta, do 15 ounces of ricotta. But if you're going to just do the cream cheese, just do 8 ounces. Did you put 
No, your cook time would not change, actually, if you used a bigger pot and doubled the recipe. Because <clears throat> the noodles still cook in the same amount of time. All right. Same if you half it. Mm -hmm. There we go. And then this is just our regular yogurt cheese. This is what I use in place of mozzarella. It's, um, the, I think the yogurt cheese actually has a nice creaminess. All right, and then Karen, if you'll just let it cool for a minute, and then if you'll just taste it and salt and pepper it again if, if it needs it. That is the hardest part about pressure cooking is um, tasting it before you serve it, it's really hot. And I'm not even going to attempt to taste it. Well, I could, but it might could be interesting, yeah. So yes, we're gonna take both of these over to the side and they're gonna serve these in two separate little dishes for you, but on the same plate so that you can enjoy kind of a, a red sauce pasta and a white sauce pasta, all right? It's funny, uh, Jonathan Carpenter, one of the guys that works here, he bought his pressure cooker recently and he told me, he said, I want you to teach me how to make this. And um, I'm pretty sure he makes it like every other day now. He was eating it earlier. He was eating it earlier, yes. <laughs> he had it yesterday for lunch. He had his leftovers that he had made. So that's not bad for a bachelor way better than ramen noodles right all right let's talk cheesecake yes yes let's all right I'm sure many of you are familiar with our mixer, the Anka Shroom Original has had many names over the years, but that is what it is called now. <clears throat> this is actually the double whisk bowl that comes with standard with the machine. It comes with the stainless steel bowl, and then it also comes with the roller and scraper and the dough hook to be able to make all your breads and things like that and then it also comes standard with this double whisk bowl and it comes with two sets of whips now it comes with um, a set of whips that has lots of wires and that's for your egg white whipping cream or making your own butter from your cultured cream and then it also comes with a single wire whips for light um, light cakes I would say soft cookies like the spritzer cookie dough you could do in here if you're gonna do, um, if you're going to do like oatmeal, cranberry, raisin, walnut cookies, then I would use the big stainless steel bowl and use the roller and scraper for that, okay? But for light cookie doughs, ginger snaps, things like that, you could do the, the cookie cake paddles here. All right, so I'm just going to butter my springform pan The older one, what? The older mixers? Oh, with both sets of whips, you mean? No, the new, only the newer ones have started coming with this whip, but we set, we have them, so you can buy the set of whips. The thing with the set of whips that came with the older version, the ones for egg whites and whipping cream, the more wires the whips have, the more air it's going to beat into your food. Well, you don't wanna do that to a cake or a cookie, you do want to do that to egg whites and whipping cream and butter and things like that. But for cakes and cookies, you don't want to beat a lot of air into it. And that's why you would just use the single wire wires, but we have that, um, we have them for sale. All right, so the crust recipe. The crust recipe, you know, a traditional cheesecake crust is graham crackers and butter. Um, you can get that same taste and texture 
by combining sucanat, which is your evaporated cane juice, the soft wheat, and a little bit of butter in your Try Best blender. And just blend it up. And that is just like graham cracker crumbs. All right. Now we're going to set that aside for just a second. I'm going to move this here. All right, I'm going to put my two eggs. This is my three eight ounce packages of cream cheese that I left out overnight at room temperature so that they would soften up. I've got my speed control here. I'm just going to start this going. And I've got my two eggs. And I've got my one cup of sucanat with honey, also known as honey granules. This is an evaporated sugar cane juice product. They take the juice of the sugar cane, they remove some of the molasses off, add a mild honey, and then evaporate the moisture off of it. And you can use it one for one in place of white sugar. And then here we've got our tablespoon of vanilla. We're just gonna mix this together. One trick that I found when making cakes and things like that with the honey granules, when you're typically beating eggs and sugar together at the beginning of a cookie recipe or something like that, let it beat and then turn it off and let it sit for about five minutes. Let those honey granules or the sucanat, sucanat with honey, whatever you wanna call it, let it kind of dissolve into the egg mixture or the cream mixture or whatever and then turn it back on and remix it. And that way it'll get rid of any grittiness that the, that the honey granules has. All right, so in the meantime, we're gonna get our pressure cooker ready. And we'll move the pressure cooker into the camera if we need to in a minute, but right now it's not that important that you're watching. We're gonna use the stand and we're gonna pour some water in there to build steam a cup or two. All right, I'm gonna let that sit and just rest for a minute. Like I said, to dissolve the honey granules, I am going to just stir this around, make sure that there's no cream cheese hiding anywhere in the bowl. All right, I'm gonna let that sit for a second while we get our pan the rest of the way ready. Five minutes, just while you get the rest of your ingredients together, and that's usually how I do it. If I'm getting cookies ready or something, then I will, um, then I'll beat my eggs and my honey granules together, and then I'll turn it off and let it sit while I get out all my other ingredients, while I grind my wheat into my flour, while I get my baking powder, my baking soda, and get everything else laid out. I've also learned that if you want to get your kids in the kitchen with you, helping you cook, if you will take a few minutes and pre-measure out, these are like, these glass bowls are like the greatest invention ever. Get all your ingredients measured out and then have them just dump what's in the bowl into whatever it is that you're cooking that goes way better than saying, here's the salt and a teaspoon, put two of these level into our food that we're, no, that's not ever a good idea. I mean, depending on, your children may be geniuses and they can handle that, mine are not. So um, I also tell people all the time, if your children are having trouble in math with fractions, get them in the kitchen helping you cook. Nothing will make more sense than teaspoons and tablespoons and quarter of a cup, third of a cup, and all that when they can actually visually see it. It helps tremendously. All right, I've put our, I've buttered our springform pan. This is an eight inch springform pan. And I put our crust in there. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try and do it for you guys. If you will put a piece of wax paper or aluminum foil down 
and that way you can get it all the way up the sides. And then you can dump the rest of it back in and just press it down into the bottom. Now what I've done for you today, because I already made one yesterday for y'all, so it was nice, now it's nice and cold and chilled, mini chocolate chips. Spread that on the bottom. That'll create a nice chocolate crust. You could certainly have added the chocolate chips into your little Tribest blender and chopped them up or added some cocoa powder in with your soft wheat and, and, your, and your sucanat and your butter to make like a chocolate graham cracker crust. You could certainly do any of those things. All right, okay, let's turn this on. Let's let it, we'll let that beat for just a second and then we'll pour it into here. While we're letting that mix, let's go ahead and add our half a teaspoon of vanilla to our soured cream. And then our agave nectar to sweeten it up just a little bit. Carefully measured, remember? That was about three tablespoons. Okay. Now what we're gonna do, <clears throat> yeah. I put the butter in the pan and then, but the actual, what is it, two tablespoons of butter that it calls for, I actually chunked that up and put that in the try best and blended it all together. Mm-hmm. Yep. Did that all together. When I made it yesterday, I made enough for both the cheesecake I made yesterday and the cheesecake today, so it was already all blended up together. All right, so now we're just gonna pour our cheesecake batter. And this was the question I got yesterday when I was making the cheesecake from the guys, you are making us a cheesecake, right? And I said, yes. The one I actually make in the class will be left over for you guys to eat. They were quite happy. All right, so now we're just gonna spread out. And you could do whatever you wanted to this. I mean, if you wanted to make a pumpkin cheesecake, use this as your basic batter, add some pumpkin puree and some pumpkin pie spice and you're good to go. Um, if you wanted to do lemon, then you add lemon extract instead of the vanilla or the orange extract instead of the vanilla. I mean, the sky's the limit, really. If you wanted to make it a chocolate cheesecake, add some cocoa powder to the, to the cheesecake mixture. You can basically just use this as your base for your cheesecake. And um, I love, we carry um, some small, they're like four inch cheesecake spring form pans out there. It takes about like a half a cup of cheesecake filling mixture to go in each one of those. There for a while, I would make up my cheesecake batter and then I would pour half to three quarters of a cup of batter into Ziploc baggies and throw them up in my freezer. And then if I was having a girlfriend over for lunch and I wanted a small cheesecake for just the two of us, then I would take that baggie out of the freezer, drop it down in a bowl of warm water and, um, and let it thaw out in the warm water and then snip the tip off the bag and just squeeze it right into my spring form pan and then pop it into my pressure cooker and we would have, and we would have cheesecake for lunch. All right, so now what I'm gonna do is I'm going to tightly seal this aluminum foil around the pan. I don't want any moisture to get up in and under and into my cheesecake. So I'm gonna... Now this 
is where it gets tricky. You can do bread puddings the same way in your pressure cooker. And if you print any of our handouts from some of the other pressure cooking classes, I know Lars did a like a chocolate bread pudding in one of the last classes when he was here. The tricky part is getting this in and out. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna create a handle. Fold it over. Now you're gonna lay your whatever you've got, a casserole dish that's full of bread pudding or a casserole dish with custard in it. We've also done custard in the pressure cooker before or the cheesecake and now you're just going to and this gives you a handle to be able to get it in and out. All right. So now our water is boiling in there. Turn this back up to high. We're gonna close off our lid. We're gonna bring that up to pressure and then that is gonna pressure, uh, and I think I took this from the other pressure cooking class. She went ahead and gave you the how to bake it in your oven if you don't have a pressure cooker yet. But then in the pressure cooker, it's gonna pressure cook for 35 minutes and then you're gonna let it natu naturally release and then you're gonna take it out of the pressure cooker and then put it in your refrigerator and let it cool, which is what I've done for you already. And obviously our meatloaf is done, hopefully. The timer's done, right? Right. And here is the cheesecake that I made yesterday. <clears throat> I don't know if it's going to fit. Yes. There we go. Now we're just going to top it with our sour cream mixture. And do you see how quickly this is already coming up to pressure? Because I let my pot get warm with my water. You just wanna make sure that while you're mixing up your cheesecake that you don't let that water boil out. So make sure you put enough in there to begin with that it doesn't, that that doesn't happen. Spread this out. Um, you would just need to check. And we've got we've got several different size springform pans. We've got the little minis, we've got seven inch, eight inch, and nine inch. I know the eight and the nine inch have to go in the bigger ones. The seven inch will fit down in the six liter stock pot, and then of course the minis will. Um, and the minis you can stack on top of each other. So, um, and you could, I mean, you could technically stack another eight inch if you, you know, if you had, I think this is the eight liter. Um, if you had the 10 liter, I think you can stack two eight or nine inch spring forms in there on top of each other. And the cooking time wouldn't change because they're each in their own pan. So the cooking time would not change at all. All right. And then here we've got, I just took some fresh frozen strawberries and chopped them up, put a little bit of agave nectar to sweeten them up just a little bit. And we're just gonna spread this out. Our pressure is already up, so I'm going to The important thing with custards and cheesecake and bread puddings is try really hard not to let them come too far over pressure. Because if that happens, a lot of times you'll, your cheesecake will split on top if that happens. 
Now, if it splits, cover it with strawberries or chocolate or something and no one will ever know. All right, there is that. Doesn't that look good? I sure hope you can chop strawberries. Wow. Oh my goodness gracious. Olivia, you did such a good job chopping strawberries. Oh my goodness. You should win a prize here. Come serve food. There you go. She is a mess. Let me just tell you that right now. It's so funny. Olivia Olivia's the youngest and I'm the oldest and there are seven in between us. And I was almost 16 when she was born. So we do totally do not have a normal like sister relationship. I try to act like her mom. She refuses, you know, it's this tug of war all the time kind of thing. And um, she was actually three when we when I got married. And um, and so everybody always asked when my husband and I got married, they were like, oh, when are you going to start a family? And I'm like, three year old sister at home. We are making sure mom and dad are done before we start. That's how it roll. That's how we roll. So, yes, no, no, no. So, <clears throat> all right, let's go back to the meatloaf and mashed potatoes while they, I will bring the meatloaf and mashed potatoes up here. And we're going to pray that the meatloaf is done, aren't we? Yes, we are. Um, let me get some serving dishes for our carrots. I didn't think about that beforehand. All right. This is going to be hot. All righty, yum, yum, yum. That's up to you guys. Do you guys want your dinner first or do you want your dessert first? Dessert first. <laughs> we asked them, we shouldn't have asked. We should have just, you learn that with kids. Don't ask, just do, right? Um, I, yeah, but when there's no kids here, adults act like kids. That's the, that's the truth, isn't it? Um, will you hand me one of those silver serving trays right there? Somebody want to tell me what the internal temperature is supposed to be on our meatloaf? That was on there, isn't it? One fifty-five. Yes. Um, I believe you're correct. We are good. Okay. So what I'm going to do. Now one thing that I like to do with my meatloaf. Oh, are there potatoes stuck to the bottom? That's all right. Oh, come on. Come off of there, Mr. Potato. Yay. Okay, is I like to pop this just kind of in the broiler while I get my potatoes all mashed, okay? And that way it doesn't look like boiled meatloaf. All right, let's get our carrots uncovered here. There's all that melted butter and the orange zest and the honey granules. So now you're going to have a nice sweet glaze on our carrots. All right. 
There's that. Let's get our potatoes mashed. There's our funky potato masher. Almost feels like a plunger. I don't know how I feel about this. Uh-uh. No, there's so much down underneath. It still has to be mashed. And the starches from the potatoes. You all, um, there, it was only half covered, the potatoes. So depending on how many much potatoes you have in there, you're just going to half cover them. That's it. There again, though, it's you could use less if you wanted to. But the nice part here is that I didn't pour any of that liquid off. So none of your potato flavor, none of your nutrients, nothing's gone from here. It's all enclosed. And that's the same with any of our foods that we've been cooking. It's all enclosed. You're not losing anything to steam and boiling over. So, you know, look at how bright our carrots are. And they cooked for 35 minutes. I mean, normally if you cooked carrots on a stovetop for 35 minutes, they would not be this bright. Okay, now I like my skin on my mashed potatoes. I'm a country girl and that is how we eat our mashed potatoes. And they don't have to be perfectly smooth. They're kind of chunky. And so you are losing none of, None of the nutrients here. But yeah, see, that's not, see, we were afraid of all that water in there, but the starchy, the starches from the potatoes, they thicken that right up. All right. <clears throat> now we are going to Add a little bit of milk to this. If mom didn't use all my milk yesterday, she was making yogurt. She didn't. I better see if there's one already open. Hold on, hold that thought. Nope, she doesn't. All right, so we're just gonna add, it's really just to your liking and to your taste, and I hardly ever measure this. I gave you a measurement just because I, know you, I knew you would ask for it, but really it's just whatever you like. I'm gonna dump our cheese in. Here again, this is the rest of that yogurt cheese. Oh, I meant to ask you, what did y'all think of the skillet pasta and the Alfredo? Did y'all enjoy that? Super, super easy dishes. Uh -huh. I would probably put the carrots in the solid bottom insert, not the perforated insert. And still, I would still probably just cover it with aluminum foil, 10, 12 minutes probably is all I would do. If you just wanted to do, I'm sorry, her question was if I wanted to do the carrots and the potatoes all by themselves without the meatloaf, how would I do that and stack them on top of each other? I would go ahead and get the, the solid bottom insert and put the carrots with the butter and the sucanat with honey and the zest of the orange in there cover it with aluminum foil, sit it on top of your potatoes and do it about 10 or 12 minutes. All right, now I am gonna taste the potatoes because I am really picky about mashed potatoes and how much salt they have. Potatoes are one of those things that sometimes it can just be so hard to get them salted enough. I have found with pressure cooking though, if you really salt them really well before you cook them, 
you don't typically have to add any later on. But if you only do a little bit of salt in the beginning, it feels like you're adding tons after they're cooked. Only a little more. We're actually doing really good on that. And I, you, you, y'all, I said a little, and you're like, oh my gosh, it is five pounds of potato. Okay. There is that. Can I get another hot pad from somebody? Do y'all have one I can have? Just put it right there for me. Thank you. All right. And I don't want anybody to freak out. The red on top is not raw meat. That's that chili sauce that we put on top. Okay. So there's that. Now, who likes brown gravy with their meatloaf? Or does anybody like gravy with their meatloaf? Okay, I didn't write this down. You're gonna have to write this down. The recipe to make brown gravy. Are you ready? I hear the click clicks of, of pens. It is two cups of beef broth. You're gonna bring that to a simmer and then you are going to whisk in a third of a cup of bean flour and it can be any kind of bean flour. It can be baby lima bean, it can be great northern, it can be black eyed pea, it can be 16 bean soup mix, it can be whatever you want it to be. So a third a cup of bean flour that you grind in your grain mill, either your wonder mill, whisper mill, neutral mill, whichever one you, per, you own, and you're gonna whisk that in, okay? So two cups of beef broth, a third a cup of bean flour, whisk it all together, Reduce your heat and simmer for three to five minutes. And that is it. That is it. If you want to make cream of chicken soup, same measurements, just use chicken broth, obviously, and use a white bean flour, like a great northern bean or a baby lima, um, small white navy. When you use a white bean, it does not add any flavor to whatever the broth is that you're using. So if you're going for cream of chicken soup or cream of, you know, mushroom soup, something like that, um, then you're going to use a white bean flour. And then, um, but it's the same measurements. Two cups of liquid, third a cup of bean flour, whisk it together, simmer for three to five minutes. When that, if you're making the cream of chicken soup recipe, if you will let that completely cool, it becomes the consistency of a can of cream of chicken soup. So then you can use that in any of your casserole recipes that hopefully you stopped making because canned foods are horrible for you. They've got so much junk in them and then not to mention they're packaged in an aluminum can. Um, and now you can make it any time that you want. That smothered chicken recipe that I told you about earlier with the slivered onions and the chicken breasts and the cream of chicken soup, that's where I got it from. That's what I use, is that recipe right there. Top it with some baby portobello mushrooms as well and smother the whole thing. Salt and pepper, a little garlic, you're good to go. Okay, this is ready, but they're serving your cheesecake. So we'll let this kind of cool down for just a minute. Yes. The broths that I use, um, I do not believe that they're low sodium. Um, they're not, they're not. These are the kind, these are the ones that we carry. Um, and so they are not, they are not low sodium. They're just regular old organic broths. Is there any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Uh, 
her question was, can she make the bean flour ahead of time and keep it? I wouldn't. It's the same with your grains. Once you crack it open, it begins to oxidize. Yep. But you can make the cream of chicken soup or the gravy and then can it <laughs> or freeze it and have it on hand whenever you, you want it. But it's so easy. And you can actually do the same measurements with the broth and the lentils, grind the lentils, and make a creamy lentil soup. It's really good, really good. And it's just broth and, lent and lentil flour and a little salt and pepper. Yes, you could certainly do the same thing with your dehydrated tomatoes and make a tomato soup that way. Absolutely, absolutely, yes ma'am. Can I cook what? Dry beans in the pressure cooker? Oh, absolutely you can cook them in there. Um, and you don't always have to soak them overnight either. Um, in fact, go on the website, find the soup class that I did back in January, and I do the 16 bean soup recipe out of our cookbook in the pressure cooker. What was it, 45 minutes? Is that how long we did it? I think it was, I don't remember now. That was a few months ago. That's how good my memory is. That's what kids will do to you. Just the plain beans, yep. And then all of the cookbooks have um, times in them of, like black eyed peas only take like 10 minutes. Um, lent, that lentil, the, the stew we made at the very beginning of class with the lentils and the sweet potatoes, that was only 10 minutes. And that cooked the chicken, that fully cooked the lentils, and those were not soaked lentils. They were dry right out of the bag. So yeah, it's really fast. You don't have to soak the beans overnight. They, there is a way to do a quick soak, and if you print the, um, if you print off the pressure cooking class that Sue does, if you print that handout, there's a, a Cuban black bean and rice recipe that's outstanding. And she shows you how to do a quick soak, cooking the beans for two minutes in lots of water and then dumping the water off. And then that, it will be, re it's just like if you had soaked them overnight and you just cooked them for two minutes. And that's a, called a quick soak. All right, there y'all are enjoying the cheesecake. Once they get that passed out, we will serve you guys the, um, the meatloaf and mashed potatoes and the carrots. Um, but we're going to go ahead and sign off to our online friends. And, uh, and then you guys are always welcome to stay around and eat and talk and all that kind of stuff as long as you want. All right. There we go. That's it. <laughs>